Welcome. Um, I want to let you know that I'm happy to see everybody here to celebrate our first event for Open Access Week. Um, if you haven't already had a chance to do so, we have pizza and drinks over on the side there, along with a few sweet treats if they're not already gone. Um, there are sign-in sheets and handouts in the back, and we'll have some evaluations at the end. Um, if y'all wouldn't mind filling that out, that really helps us out to figure out what kind of programming and services we can offer um, in the future. Uh, my name is Colleen Lyon. I'm scholarly communications librarian here at the library. And on behalf of our Open Access Week group, I am very happy to say we are officially starting Open Access Week here at UT. Uh, Open Access Week. Yay. <laughs> Open Access Week is an international event that's now in its eighth year, um, and the whole idea behind it is to kind of celebrate and discuss uh, the idea of increasing access and reuse uh, of the products of research that are happening here at UT and at other universities around the world. Uh, international Open Access Week doesn't officially start till Monday, but we were so excited to have Aaron here. Um, and also, this is Texas, so we decided we were going to start a little bit early. Um, so we're kicking it off today um, with our keynote speech, uh, speaker, Aaron McKiernan. And um, let me get this right. Erin McKiernan is a researcher in experimental and computational neuroscience. She received her PhD in physiological sciences from the University of Arizona in 2010. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Canada, and visiting scholar at the Institute of Mathematics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She is an advocate for open access, open data, and open science, and she has written about open access for international media outlets such as The Conversation and The Guardian. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Erin McKiernan. Thank you. Thanks so much. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. I have to get used to this. This is the first time I use one of these microphones, so bear with me. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm very excited to be here to be kicking off uh, Open Access Week a little bit early. It's always good to have more time to talk about Open Access. A week is not enough. So, um, so I'm going to start today with one very simple message, but I think it's a very important one. And that is that there are many academics in the world that don't have access to the literature that they need. Um, I emphasize this because we are still, uh, today in 2014, hearing messages like this one. So this is from uh, Dr. Gordon Nelson, who's president of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. He did an interview in August with uh, Scholarly Kitchen. And uh, in response to a question about the public access challenge, he said, frankly, I'm unclear what the public access challenge is. Who does not have access? I'm not at a large university. I've always been able to get the papers I needed over the years. So, <laughs> um, there are many, many things wrong with this message. First of all, being that uh, the assumption that every person who wants access works at a university. There are taxpayers, there are patients, there are citizens, there are all kinds of people who don't work at a university who need ac access. And so my, my general reaction to this, um, <laughs> Well, yeah. So I actually wrote to Dr. Nelson, um, I wrote him an open letter and said, hey, you know what, we do have an access problem and, and here's some of the evidence that, that shows uh, what the problem is and um, I'd like for you to publicly acknowledge that. Uh, I think that would be good for the Council of Scientific Society presidents to be aware that there's a problem because if we're not aware there's a problem, um, you know, obviously we're not going to move towards fixing that problem. Uh, he did answer my letter, but he didn't really address whether or not he agreed that there was a public access challenge, we're still trying to communicate and see if we can make some progress there. Uh, and, but here's some of the, the data that I was uh, presenting to him and others to argue that we do have a, an access problem. So this is just one example. This is an institution in Mexico that I worked for uh, the previous year. And so this is the National Institute of Public Health. It's a federal research institute, so it receives money from the government of Mexico, from the Secretary of Health. It has about 300 researchers and about 700 students. So this is not a small institution. By Federal Research Institute standards, it's, it's fairly large for Mexico. Um, and, but this is what their, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. This is what their access looks like. So a total of 139 journals accessible via the institution. When you think about the fact that we have around 30,000 journals, um, that is a tiny, tiny percentage. And of those journals, uh, 88, we ha they, they have electronic access. Um, sorry, this is making noise. So 66 of those are electronic access via paid subscription, and 22 of those are provided free by some type of publisher agreement. 
51 of those journals are print version only. That means there's a single copy in the library, and if those academics want to read an article, they need to go there, copy that article. The reason for that is that the print-only subscriptions are much, much cheaper than the electronic uh, subscriptions. And so this is a cost issue for them. Um, they have limited access through a consortium. This is a, a set of institutions in Mexico that pools their money to try to get a little bit more access for their academics, but still that's very, very limited. So if you think about this, this is really not sufficient access for academics who are working in public health. And so let's talk about the cost of that. So researchers in this institute are studying public health issues, uh, Chagas disease, cholera, dengue, HIV, influenza, malaria, tuberculosis, all of these are serious public health problems in Mexico. Uh, we need to find solutions to these. And for that, the academics need the most up-to-date information, the most up-to-date uh, research findings, uh, but they don't have access to journals like annual, annual uh, reviews of medicine, current biology, nature medicine. These are where the most important new findings in their fields are being published, and they can't read it. Okay, now you can, ha you can imagine that that has dire consequences for their scientific research, for their progress, and in, um, in, a, in a bigger scheme for the public health of Mexico, right? Uh, and what is the limiting factor? Well, it's, it's very simply cost. So um, as many of you know, the publishers don't make the prices of these journals public. So I can't tell you what, exactly what those costs are. But I have seen some examples in some of these journals. A single journal for an electronic subscription can cost as much as the entire annual salary of an of a entry-level researcher there. So this is not something that the institution can afford to do. They have to choose between uh, conducting educational programs, research programs, or buying access. And so often that means foregoing access. All right, so lack of access is really a global problem. It's not just Mexico that's suffering with this. It's not just developing countries that are suffering with this. It's also developed countries, um, smaller institutions that don't have large library budgets to buy subscriptions. So this is an example of um, data you can see via openaccessbutton.org. Currently, that page is down because they're going to have a new launch this week uh, with all kinds of new features. I'm very excited to see what they do. Uh, but in less than a year of operation, they registered over 9,000 paywalls all over the world. So this is a very clear example of the fact that researchers all over the world are suffering, are struggling to get access to the research that they need. Okay, so what can I do? Uh, we have national level mandates, we have institutional level mandates, but I think it's very important that we make individual commitments as researchers also to, and try, to try to improve access to the academic literature. And so um, my personal commitment is to support open access. So here's my pledge to be open. Um, it has a few different elements. So first of all, I've committed to not edit, review, or work in any way for closed access journals. I think it's very important that if I'm going to commit my time, if I'm going to volunteer my time, that that be for a journal who is promoting openness and not the contrary. Um, I will blog my work and post preprints whenever possible. So this is in the interest of having science be a transparent process, not just I publish my article and that's all you get to see. So there are all kinds of discussions about how I designed my experiments, um, what worked, what didn't work, what maybe doesn't go into the final published product. So I'd like to share as much of that as possible um, in, in the interest of opening up the entire process. Uh, I will publish only in open access journals. This is a personal commitment that I've made in the last um, few years. And that has to do, again, with supporting publishers that I think are doing things right. Um, there are great hybrid options. I don't um, discount that. And I certainly think that that's a great option for many people. But for me, I'd like to go with the open access uh, journals exclusively. That by extension means that I won't publish in Cell, Nature, or Science. I may have to actually change this because as we'll see later, Nature now has a journal that's fully open access, which I'm very excited to see. Um, but for right now, I've made this decision and um, this is where many people tell me this is a very risky career for, move for you, especially as an early career researcher. Um, and, and also the last one, that I will pull my name off a paper if the co-authors refuse to be open. Again, people tell me this is a risky move. It could be. But what I feel very strongly is that if I'm going to make it in science, it has to be on terms that I can live with. And if I've seen firsthand on a daily basis, and I've experienced it myself, and I've seen my students struggle with access problems, um, 
locking up my work is not something that I could that I could live with. Now, I understand that especially early career researchers have a lot of concerns when it comes to open access, and that's in part because they hear messages like this every day uh, from peers, from mentors. Uh, they see it in the media. You know, boycotting academic publishers is a career risk for young scientists. Uh, how early career researchers could suffer by deciding to publish only open access. Um, and I think part of the problem is propagation of some of the myths here. So if I publish in OA journals, that means I'll be hiding my work away in less prestigious journals, it'll be less visible, um, that I have to relegate my work to low impact factor journals, that, I, that the peer review will be of low quality, this is one we hear a lot, um, that I won't get a job or a, or a grant or tenure and promotion, and finally, that it'll cost too much. So these are probably the most common concerns that I hear uh, from early career researchers with respect to publishing open access. So I'd like to address each one of these and show why um, each one of these is not true and why, and, and why I think that we can share our work and still be successful as early career researchers, actually at any level, but especially as early career researchers. So let's address first uh, the visibility and prestige issue. So be open, get more citations. This is the main message here. There are a lot of scientific studies coming out that show that if you publish in open access, either through an open access journal or through self-archiving, either the gold or the green route, so to speak, um, that you, you get more citations. So this is a um, review by Wagner 2010. I'll make these slides available so you'll have all these uh, resources. Uh, and he found, when he compared all the studies that he found looking at open access versus non-open access publications, he um, studies actually, he found that seven studies saw no advantage of publishing open access, but 38 studies did find an advantage. So this is over, overwhelming evidence that um, for the most part we can say publishing openly does give you more citations. This is also true if you post your work as preprints. So this is an example from Archive. Um, how many people have heard of Archive? Right, so this is a um, preprint server. It started out primarily for, I think it was physics and mathematics, and now it's kind of extended. Um, but this shows that if articles were published um, in archive prior to being published in a regular peer-reviewed journal, they receive more citations. Of course, they start to receive citations earlier because they're available, right? But they, they continue to, um, to get more citations for several months, if not years, afterwards. Okay? Uh, and this citation advantage holds as well for open data. So it's not just articles. If you, if you publish an article and you make the data behind that article openly available, your study tends to get more citations. So here's an example, uh, the data not available in pink, the data available in blue, and you can see the number of citations there. Uh, so overwhelming evidence that you actually get more visibility from publishing openly. Okay, so what kind of visibility will your data bring you? How about nearly 18,000 downloads? I would be thrilled if anything I ever produced got that many downloads, okay? That means people are using your work, people are talking about your work, people are citing your work. This is uh, Data Dryad, by the way. This is a place where you can store data openly. You can get a DOI for that data. People can cite you. Um, there's instructions on there on how to cite the data set and how to cite the original article. Uh, so you can imagine how many citations you might get if somebody's downloading your, art, your data 18,000 times. So, now, I know that open data is a contentious issue, probably more controversial than making articles open. I understand that researchers have a lot of concerns about making their data open. Um, one of those concerns is often what we refer to as scooping, so losing out on publications. Uh, I'm not denying that scooping can happen, but it's extremely rare. And what's more likely to happen when you open up your data is that you get more citations, you get possibilities for collaborations, that you open more doors. Uh, and so I think that it's very important that we start to encourage data sharing. One of the best ways to do that is to educate researchers, is to show them that they can get more citations. Every academic wants more citations. Okay, so this is a great way to, to, to convince academics that this is something that can help them in their careers. Uh, have clear policies on citation of primary data. I think a lot of researchers are worried, if I put my data out there, how do I know that somebody's going to cite me? If we have very clear policies on that, especially, for example, at a journal level, if a journal is requiring open data, 
um, that they have a policy that says, this is how we would like you to cite that data. I think that would make a lot of researchers feel more secure in putting their data out there. Um, we need to recognize data sharing in tenure and promotion. This is a huge problem. There's a, there's a big mismatch between our evaluation systems and what we should, I think, be recognizing uh, in terms of sharing academic outputs. Uh, so if we put some of these, these aspects like data sharing or open access publication directly into our hiring, tenure, promotion evaluations, we're going to encourage people to do that because now they're getting points for it, quite literally. And that's important. Um, provide financial support for data preparation. So open data doesn't just require you throwing out your spreadsheet on the internet somewhere. It has to be in a format that somebody can understand and somebody can reuse. And that requires time and sometimes money to put it into that format. And so it's very important that we don't just force people to do it and just say, you know, you need to put your data out there. But we, we provide them with resources that help them do that. That we provide them with financial support and that we start to develop better infrastructure for data deposit and storage. Um, this is particularly a concern in neuroscience where we're generating very, very large data sets. Where are we going to store that? Who's going to curate that? If we can start showing researchers that we're working on solutions for that, I think they're going to be more excited about potentially sharing their data. And I just want to recommend this article here. Um, this is a very nice article that gives several suggestions about how we can encourage people to share data. So. Um, I hope I convinced you that you'll get more visibility and potentially more prestige by sharing. So let's address um, myth number two. So I have to publish in low impact factor journals. So the first message I'd like to leave you with here is don't worship the impact factor. We know that impact factor is a flawed measure, that it says little to nothing about the scientific or academic quality of the work. Um, this is a journal level metric. So if I'm looking at an individual researcher and an individual article, that journal level metric tells me very, very little about that work. Um, if you'd like to read more, uh, this is an excellent post by Stephen Curry on why we should ditch the impact factor as a measure. Um, but I understand that there are many, many institutions that are still using this in their evaluations. And until that goes away, academics are going to pay attention to impact factor. And they're going to look at, OK, does this journal have an impact factor or not? But I don't think that has to be a limiting factor in terms of publishing open access. So these are all examples that I've selected of uh, open access journals that have pretty good impact factors. Um, so Cell Reports, uh, this is a Cell Press Elsevier journal. Frontiers has a very nice series of journals with varying impact factors from, say, two to four. Uh, Plus has some very high impact factor uh, journals in medicine and, um, of course, their uh, their big kind of flagship journal is plus one. Um, that's a pretty good impact factor. It depends on your field, of course, but it's moderately, uh, it's in the moderate range. BMC Medicine, uh, BMC, the BMC series has a number of journals with decent to high impact factors. Uh, open Biology, this is the Royal Society Publishing. Uh, this is their open access journal. They're also going to launch a new one that has the royal name, or, um, but they have a, a very good Im uh, impact factor there. These are two, this is the one I'm, I'm particularly excited about. So Nature Communications up until just recently was a hybrid journal and they just decided to go fully gold open access, which I think is a huge thing for Nature to decide to do. This is their first Nature branded journal that's gone fully open access and they're doing it right with the right kind of licensing. Um, their APC is very, very high. So hopefully we can get them to lower that in future years. Um, this is another journal by MPG. Uh, this is a particular one in my field, but it's just an example of a society journal, a scholarly society journal that has a decent impact factor. So there's all kinds of publishing options if impact factor is something that you're concerned about. And just to help people find some of those options, I made a tiny, tiny list of uh, open access journals that have impact factors. I've put that up on Figshare. You can find the DOI here in the slides. Um, this is obviously biased by my publishing interest, but I'm hoping that we'll expand that in time to give people a resource to, to find um, OA journals. Okay. Peer review at OA journals is poor quality. This is one we hear a lot. I'm guessing that many librarians in the room have heard this from academics multiple times. Um, and I'd really like to nip this in the bud because I, I just don't think this is true. So first of all, if we're looking at retraction rate as a measure of 
as a potential measure of the quality of the peer review process. The retraction rate is actually highest in the high impact factor subscription journals like Nature and Science. So we're going to question what's going on with their peer review process there. Is peer review a problem? Yes, the quality of peer review is a problem. We're seeing uh, rising retraction rates that may be because we're paying more attention, um, but it also could be because of various pressures to publish. Um, so Nature and Science have had some particularly bad and high profile retractions in the last few years. So if you're looking at that as a measure of quality, you've got to say, look, um, we're having problems with peer review across the board. This is not a problem that's exclusive to open access journals. There has been, to my knowledge, no controlled study comparing the quality of peer review in open access and subscription journals. Uh, there was recently, some of you might have heard of this Bohannon sting. So John Bohannon in Science published this it was more like an opinion article or an editorial, but it was disguised as a scientific study. So he created a spoof paper, submitted it to several open access journals, and then see, it saw how many um, journals accepted or rejected that study. And what he saw was an overwhelming number of them accepted it. But you can question, uh, first of all, it wasn't a controlled study. He didn't submit this paper to any subscription journal, so we don't know how many of them would have accepted it. Uh, you can also question how he chose which journals to send it to. And many of the reputable OA publishers like Plus and Hindawi rejected that article right off the bat, right from the editorial desk. Reject. So you can see that the peer review process there is working. It's functioning well. Um, I can tell you as someone who's gone through the peer review process or seen other colleagues go through the peer review process at open access journals, it is a rigorous process, especially Plus One. A lot of people complain about Plus One. I've seen the peer review process at Plus One. It's good. It's rigorous. And so, but you don't have to take my word for it. So many, many open access journals have transparent peer review. That means that the peer review history of that article is published alongside the, the article itself. So this is an example of one I published in PeerJ. This is a relatively new open access journal. Here's the peer review history. If you want to check how rigorous it is, you can go on there. You can read every criticism that was made and every change in response that I made. So you can see um, how that process was functioning. And I think um, the more that open access journals use this, the more that we can get rid of this idea that peer review is of a poor quality in open access journals. All right, kind of lumping all these together, but I think they're related. So many people are worried, especially early career researchers, about their prospects, about jobs, about grants, about tenure. How is publishing openly going to affect that? So first of all, I think there's some evidence that the tide is changing, that people are starting to consider um, impact factor less and openness and sharing more. And I think DORA, this is the uh, San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment, is evidence of that. So how many people have heard of this? Okay, all right, so relatively few. Here's the website if you want to go and read the full declaration and if you want to sign, any individual and any institution can sign. And when you, um, over 500 organizations have already signed it, over 12,000 individuals have signed it, I've signed it. Uh, what it says basically is that we will not consider journal, uh, journal, journal level metrics like impact factor in hiring tenure promotion decisions, that the content of a paper will weigh more heavily than the journal in which it's published, which we would hope that's the way it is, right? Um, and that we will consider the value and impact of all research outfits. That means not just articles, but potentially sharing data, all kinds of outreach activities, blogging, whatever you want to consider academic uh, output, that'll be also going into potentially hiring tenure and promotion evaluations. So I think there's a lot of evidence that people are, are starting to um, to understand why this is important. Uh, I was happy to see we have at least 16 individuals from UT Austin who have signed DORA, yay. All right. I think there are also many institutions who are understanding this and changing their ways, explicitly changing their tenure and promotion policies. So BCU is a nice example. In their faculty senate, uh, I don't remember what year this, 2010, um, they decided that they would put this sentence into their tenure promotion uh, that open access publication should actually be valued higher because it's a greater public good which I think is fantastic to see. Uh, UNT has this beautiful open data manifesto there, all about why open data is important and how they'd like to support uh, faculty in sharing their data. So there are institutions, uh, and if anyone has other examples of institutions, I'd love to hear that because I think we should recognize these institutions that are, that are valuing sharing. 
funders are also getting on board with this. Funders are also saying, look, we want you to share, and not only are we going to encourage it, but in some cases we're going to mandate it. We're going to say, you have to share your articles, you have to share your data. Um, so National Institute of Health has a public access policy. Uh, it's not an open access, so they, they require you to put a free copy within 12 months of publication, but it's great. That's increased uh, a lot the, the access to the biomedical literature. Um, UK is doing fabulous in this. Welcome Trust and Research Councils UK both have open access policies, and not only that, but they've said, we want you to go with this particular Creative, creative Commons license, uh, which allows not only um, unrestricted access, but unrestricted reuse, which is very important for open access. Uh, HHMI also has a public access policy, World Bank. This is a new tool I just discovered a couple days ago. Most people know of Sherpa Romeo. Yeah, so you, on Sherpa Romeo, you can check um, whether the journal that you've published in allows you to put a copy online. Well, there's a Sherpa Juliet. Of course, there had to be a Juliet. I should have thought of this. And the Sherpa Juliet allows you to search what the open access policies are for different funders. And you can search by country. You can search by funder. Uh, it tells you, for example, for open access and, and open data, they have different levels. So whether you're required to deposit some version of, of an article that you've published, whether you're required to deposit the final full version, and um, whether you're required to, to archive that immediately upon publication or whether uh, an embargo is permitted. With open data, uh, it tells you whether data archiving is required and then whether there's a time limit on that, whether you need to do it within, for, for example, five years. So you can check any funder's policy here. Um, and I think this is an example for UK funders, but I think it's evidence that funders are caring more and more about open, open access and uh, open data. So here you can see whether their policies um, speak specifically to sharing published outputs or sharing data. All of these funders have policies on open access and open data, and many of them are providing support. This is the important thing. They're not just saying, we're forcing you to do it. They're saying, we're going to help you do it. So in some cases, they're providing this in the form of guidance. They have advisors. They have FAQs. They have all kinds of online support. In other cases, they're actually putting the repositories where you can put your articles or where you can put your, your data, and they are um, supporting that infrastructure. And in other cases, they're starting to pay whatever fees have to are associated with making those articles or, or that data open. Uh, Welcome Trust is doing particularly well in this, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, so, myth number five, OA publishing costs too much. This is one I hear a lot, uh, especially from researchers in Mexico, and I understand their concerns. We don't have large budgets for research, let alone budgets for publishing. So how can I afford an APC? And so you can have people saying, well, I really support open access, but I just can't, I don't have the money to do it, right? Well. Uh, neither do I. <laughs> so I have zero research budget. That definitely means I have zero publishing budget. Um, and I've managed through several of these mechanisms to still publish openly. So I think the first thing that many people forget is that many open access journals don't charge an article processing fee. So if you look in the directory of open access journals, uh, I'll give you the, the link to that in a minute, I think it's about 60% do not have any charges. eLife is, is one uh, example of that. So eLife doesn't charge authors to publish. Um, Journals like PeerJ, I'm a big supporter of PeerJ, they've started a, kind of a new publishing model where they have a low, low one-time membership fee. So you pay $99, and that gives you the right, for example, to publish one article per year, provided it passes peer review. Or you can pay a little bit more, I think it's up to $299 for a lifetime membership. And after that, you pay nothing. So this is a very affordable option. When I was teaching, uh, when I first arrived in Mexico, I was a high school teacher uh, by the hour. You can imagine this doesn't pay very much. And I wanted to publish an article. I went with PeerJ because the $99 membership was something I could pay out of pocket even as a by-the-hour paid high school teacher. So this is a super option. Many institutions have OA publisher memberships. Uh, BMC, for example, has publisher memberships either partial or full. Um, I was working for Arizona State University a few years back. They have a full membership, which meant that I could publish in BMC at no cost to me. The institution paid the full APC. And many people don't know that their institution has those memberships. You can go on to BMC's uh, website and check if your institution has a membership. I should have checked if UT Austin does, but I imagine they at least have a partial. 
Many institutions have OA publishing funds. They're starting to put together pools of money, um, usually on a first, first come, first serve basis, but they do have resources available for faculty or even students who want to publish open access. And so they'll help you pay those APCs. Uh, oh, I skipped this one. Many journals have waivers. This is something that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize. You can, you can talk to the editors and say, look, I just don't have the resources. Um, if you come, especially from certain developing countries, those waivers may be automatic. And so there are a lot of options there. Uh, PLUS has a general policy that says money should not be a limitation in terms of publishing work. So they will, they will work with you to find, find a way. Uh, this is a very exciting one. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about this. So recently some funders have put together charities to cover those APCs. And then finally, if none of those options work, self-archiving costs you zero. Putting a free copy on your institutional repository, your website, Figshare, whatever it is, archive, costs zero. So I don't think cost is a limiting factor. And I don't think it's something that we should use as a pretext for not publishing openly. So I said I would talk about this. This is very new. I think it just went into effect the 1st of October. So um, these are all UK funders, but I'm hoping that we'll see similar things coming out of US funders soon. So uh, these UK funders got together and said, we're going to create an open access fund. We are mandating open access, so we're going to help our authors, our, our researchers do this. So if um, they're going to be issuing grants, to people who are funded by these various organizations to publish in open access journals, and specifically ones that have fully open licensing. So open access doesn't just mean publishing in OA journals. I just said this, you can self-archive, you can go green, so to speak. So there are many, many ways you can do this. Figshare is one that's my particular favorite, but there's all kinds of other ways. Archive, bioarchive is for the life sciences. Institutional repositories, your personal website, put a copy somewhere. That's the important thing, right? So here's an example of my Figshare profile. Um, Figshare is a free service. You can go on there. You can upload all kinds of different formats. I've uploaded uh, author versions of some of my papers before when I was publishing in subscription journals. And those are some of my highly, highly viewed items. So people are reading these items. They're accessing them. They're downloading them. Here's another example. You can go green by posting a preprint. This is a version that goes online before the process of peer review takes place. You can get great feedback, but also there is a copy there that, um, that people can read for free. Uh, so this is a, one that I published oops, just a few weeks ago with PeerJ preprints. And you can also see it's already got over 100 visitors, over 100 views, over 20 downloads. So before it even goes into official publication, I'm starting to get some visibility there. So this is good for me as well, not just for those who are able to access a free copy. Here's Figshare. I want to emphasize that Figshare is not just for papers. So you can upload individual figures. You can upload videos that maybe didn't go into your publication but have some great information in them. Uh, data sets, posters, papers, theses, presentations. I have all my slides up on Figshare. Those are some of my most viewed items. Um, and people can cite you for those things. So, And your institutional repository. This is a great, great way to go green. And you guys have a great repository, so you should use it. Uh, your repository has over 300,000 unique visitors. That's some great visibility right there. Over 20, 000, uh, 25,000 items, over 1.8 million downloads. That's pretty impressive. And here are your top five users in terms of countries. So putting your work there is easy. I'm sure there's librarians here that'd be happy to help you do that and make it as painless as possible. And it's free. And it's a very easy way for you to get your work out there and make sure that um, at least your own work is accessible. The important thing in all this process is that you know your rights as an author. Okay, so if you're going to archive a copy on your website or in a repository, you need to know what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. And most importantly, if you can avoid it, do not sign your rights away. So many publishers are asking you to sign your copyright away. Why on earth? Why on earth would you do that? No, don't sign your rights away. Many of these publishers are um, capitalizing on the fact that authors don't know their rights and capitalizing on this kind of um, fear element. Well, I have to publish there, so I have to sign it away. No. So first of all, there's this nice poster you can access here that tells you about your rights. Um, one of the important ones, I think, is that even if you did sign a copyright agreement, that agreement holds only for that particular version, that last version. 
All the previous versions are not covered under that copyright agreement. So you can post those previous versions and there's nothing they can do about it. Um, and that comes directly from a copyright lawyer. So I'm not a lawyer, but. Um, so Charles Oppenheim, uh, if you've heard the name, he has some great posts on why um, those copyright agreements do not cover previous versions. Uh, the other thing you can do is instead of signing the agreement that they give you, attach an addendum. Attach an addendum like the one from Spark that allows you to re retain your rights, allows you to share your work. Um, there are many, many publishers that will accept these addendums or some variation of it. What you have to do is ask. If you don't ask, they'll just ask you to sign all your rights away. But a lot of the time publishers um, will work with you and negotiate something where you are allowed to share your work. Okay, so what does it really mean when we talk about publishing openly, right? I hope we've killed those myths. And what it really means is more exposure for your work, uh, that practitioners can apply your findings, that researchers in developing countries can see your work, taxpayers get value for their money, you get more citations, uh, you're compliant with your funder mandates, the public can access your findings, and your research can inf influence policy. As far as I see this, this is a win-win. So, my advice to early career researchers. First of all, know your options. Make a list of open access journals in your field. This is one that I made for neuroscience publishing options. Um, and so it has those journals, it has their licensing, it has their APCs, uh, whether they accept waivers, for, off of waivers, for example. If you put together a resource like this, this can help you a lot at the time where you're deciding to publish or where you're trying to convince a mentor that you, that you have options, right? Uh, the Directory of Open Access Journals can help you construct this list, okay? You can search by different keywords and find journals in that field. Uh, it's very important that you discuss open access, preprint, self-archiving, all these issues up front with your collaborators. So often in the first meeting that I have with collaborators, I say, look, we don't even have anything on paper yet, but I think it's very important you know how I feel. This is what I'd like to do with our work. This is what I won't do with our work. Um, are you okay with that? And to the date, I've, I haven't had one say, uh, no, you know what, let's not work together. All of them have been very open to the idea and said, okay, yeah, fine, we can do that. So I, I think this is important to, to get it out there in the open and, and kind of avoid potential complications later. Blog about your science. This is something that can help you increase visibility, get to other audiences that you might not have gotten to before, um, especially if you write without that scientific jargon, if you write in terms that other people can understand. Um, that can bring you even collaborations because you get in people from other fields and they say, hey, you know what, let's, let's uh, mix our approaches, let's do this, right? Be active on social media to increase visibility. So I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, I love Twitter. I think it's an excellent tool for academics to share their work, to connect with potential collaborators. I've had people offer uh, to send me fly lines to do experiments or to, you know, do a collaboration with some data analysis over Twitter. Um, I'm probably here in part because of Twitter, because uh, I first got invited to speak about open access at a conference via Twitter, and it kind of cascaded from there. So this is a tool that can help you. Um, and then document your out metrics. So Impact Story is a great tool for this. How many have heard of Impact Story? Okay, so this is my profile on Impact Story. They're now charging a small fee, I think it's $5 a month. Um, but what they do is compile everything on your article, not just citations. Okay, so my H index is pitiful. It's very, very low. And if all people are judging me by is my citations, you don't see that much impact. But if you see the Twitter impressions or the views or the downloads, these are in the thousands, these are in the hundreds. My work, my, my discussion of my work also is having an impact and an impact that's not measured by traditional uh, metrics. And so if I can show this to a potential employer or a potential funder and say, look, this is my real impact, that can help me. Okay, discussing OA with your mentor. I've talked a little bit about this already, but um, ask your mentor for a meeting. Make it short, okay, because a lot of mentors don't have a lot of time. 15 minutes, presentation. Remember that you're talking to academics. In, many, in my case, I'm talking to scientists. I need to present them with data. What they want to see is the data on this, okay? So show them the lack of access worldwide, the advances made through open science, the citation advantage, the benefits for their lab, okay? Um, Create a list of OA options. I already said this. You can share this with your mentor at the moment that they say, well, okay, where are we going to publish then? Uh, if your mentor insists on a, on a subscription or a toll access journal, 
you can discuss submitting that, that author addendum that gives you the right to share. Start these discussions early. The earlier, the better. Um, and, and the more likely that you'll find options that um, you're both happy with. So if you're in a more advanced stage of your career, how can you support early career researchers? The first thing to do is listen. Okay? If they come to you saying, look, I really believe in this, sit down, listen to what they have to say. Um, lead by example. If you are open as a, as a mentor, as a PI, others are going to see that, others are going to follow that, especially students that are under your direction. Be receptive, answer emails, tweets, questions. A lot of uh, early career researchers don't have all the information about open access publishing. They just want to know more. Answer those questions, okay? Say yes to tutorials, guest lectures, talks at meetings. Um, do not consider where people publish in making hiring tenure promotion decisions. So that's the sign Dora part, right? And stick to it. Write open access publishing funds into your grants. A lot of funders will allow you to write this explicitly into your grants, and then your graduate students and your postdocs don't have to worry where those APCs are coming from. And then finally, if you're on committees or you're in upper administration in some way, create institutional level incentives for being open. Give them points for sharing their data, sharing their research. Uh, conferences are also a great way to uh, empower early career researchers to advocate for openness. So this is one that we're going to be running this year in Washington, D.C. in November. It's called OpenCon. This is the first year that we're going to be doing this. Uh, and here's the website. So this is a conference for students and early career researchers focusing on education and advocacy training. We're going to get them that last day on the Hill in D.C. talking to uh, politicians about how we can change things. Uh, and if you'd like to get involved in this, this, you can go to this website right here, this link, and you can host a satellite event at your institution. So we will have live stream, we will have recorded sessions. You can organize your own event, you can invite your own speakers and then live stream some of the other sessions. The point is that you get people in the door and start educating them about open science. We're going to have a whole um, session on open data as well. So uh, this is a really good way to get those conversations going. And next year, if you'd like to sponsor students, that's also a fantastic way. We, we, um, we try to make sure that all students get travel scholarships to go to this. I think we have students from 40 different countries coming in. So, All right, so in sum, don't lock up your research. This is what it looks like from the outside. Big thanks, by the way, to my dad for doing all these drawings. Um, he's a great artist. But really, quite seriously, this is what it looks like when you can't access articles. It's a daily, daily frustration, and it slows down scientific progress. It slows down learning for your students. So some take-home messages. There doesn't have to be a conflict between being open and being successful. I hope that I've showed you that there are various ways that you can share your work uh, without sacrificing your success. And in fact, in many cases, it can help your career. It can make you more visible. It can get the word out there about your work. It can get you more citations. Um, this is an important one, I think, especially for graduate students and postdocs. At any stage in your career, you have the right to stand up for what you believe in. And if you believe in openness, stand up for it. Because it's going to take all of us at every career level to make this happen, to make this culture change in academia happen. And if you do that, these are some of the people you're going to help. So I always like to put a face to the problem. Um, these are my students, uh, students I worked with in Puerto Rico, uh, students and researchers that I worked with in Mexico. These are the people that will really benefit from your support of open access. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Erin? Yes. Yeah, I think that started for me first when I graduated um, with my PhD. So I had worked all my academic life at a research one institution with excellent access. I almost never had a problem, almost never hit a paywall. Um, almost the moment that I graduated, that access was taken away. And all of a sudden, I knew what it felt like every day to, to hit paywalls. And so um, within a few months, I started working at another institution. I got access back, but that, but that experience stuck with me. But I think um, for me, this passion got even stronger when I went, first of all, a little over three years ago and started working in Puerto Rico and then, and then afterwards in Mexico. Because there you see 
on a daily basis how people struggle with this. So, and especially how my students were struggling. I think that was even more frustrating than me struggling with getting access. So having them come to me and say, I'm super excited about this new thing that, I, that I'm learning about in class, or I'm super excited about this new research project, but I have all these articles and I can't access a single one of them. That's horrible. And, and so for me, um, seeing that happen, you know, sitting next to colleagues at a conference, and it's her primary field, and she's writing to everyone she knows to try to get this article because she can't get it. And so seeing that firsthand, I think, was really what, what did it for me. I think that's, a, that's part of the problem. There are a lot of people who don't see that. Um, who don't see that there is an access problem. That's one of the things that I think the open access button is going to be working on, actually showing researchers each time someone in the world hits a paywall on their article to say, hey, look, you know, all these people here, they can't access your work. And I hope that that message is going to hit home when people start seeing that more, more directly. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. So <laughs> just delayed. The question was how I got into open access, how I got passionate about open access. Any other questions? Everyone's going to go out and publish open access. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. None? All right. Well, I'm here uh, for the rest of the afternoon, too. If you have some questions, you want to talk more about open access, open science, open data, um, I'm more than happy to do that. So thank you all. <laughs>